Okay, welcome to lecture 6.1. We're going to talk about non-holonomic constraints in this lecture. Uh, so I'll start with an example um, to give an idea of what we're talking about when we um, think about motion constraints. So the example is going to be one that uh, many of you are familiar with if you have taken a, a driving test for a car. So we're going to talk about parallel parking. So if I have a curb uh, that I want to park against, and then there are a couple of cars parked against that curb already, and I want to move my car into the empty spot between the two of them. So my car is this, and if I want to get into the spot here, this dotted line, is the goal, right? So you try to par you try to park into this spot. If um, a car uh, was so kind, we could simply move from the left to the right um, to get into that spot. And that would make the most sense, right? So there is a, um, a space for us here. And if I could move left to right, that would be great. But we can't, right? Because the car has wheels, the only the front wheels turn. And uh, it's, it's not possible to do this kind of uh, maneuver due to the nature of the wheels. So um, the parallel parking maneuver actually occurs like so. Um, you have to pull your car up beside the, uh, the front car. You sort of get close, and then you back into the position. And the way you back into this position, the rear wheels follow a basic behavior like so. And they end up there. The front wheels, they swing out wide. And that's not quite right. They sort of swing out right wide and they end up here. So you do this interesting um, rear uh, manu backing maneuver to manage to get your car. And I'll put the uh, front wheels in uh, red there. So to get your car parallel parked, you have to move in a certain way. So if we think about this in terms of configuration constraints and motion constraints, uh, the configuration is not constrained in the sense that the car can be present in this place, but you have to move in a certain way to be able to get the car into that uh, location. So we have a motion constraint, but no configuration constraint to get there. Now, um, we know too that in reality, if I push hard enough, I could slide the car over uh, there's a high coefficient of friction, and if I get um, enough force, we could overcome that coefficient of friction, and you could slide it in this fashion. So it's good to keep in mind that uh, the, these motion constraints that we introduce, they're really just modeling tools. Um, they will, uh, we can introduce a hard motion constraint here that ensures that we would have to parallel park instead of sliding over, but that is only a model that represents reality only in the sense that uh, we uh, constrain it, um, constrain reality to be uh, in, in one way. Okay, so what do these motion constraints look like? <clears throat> um, recall that uh, we have our holonomic constraints from the last lectures. They have to do with configuration. Um, so um, these are constraints that are uh, 
having to do with the location of points and the orientation of reference frames. Right. And they took the basic form like this. We had a whole and open constraint vector function that could be a function of some coordinates and um, we could have up to capital N coordinates and it might have also T explicitly and um, capital N includes the independent and dependent coordinates that we use for that system so we have some kind of holonomic constraint equations and then the non holonomic constraint equations Right. We've already said have to do with motion, and more specifically, um, these are constraints on the velocity of points or the angular velocity of reference frames. In these equations, we'll take this form. We'll say that we have a vector function non-holonomic, so an n. And they are now going to be functions of the time derivatives of the generalized coordinates, the generalized coordinates, and potentially explicitly time. And they will have to be equal to 0. Okay, and these Q's are strictly the generalized coordinates. So Q, a vector Q, and Q bar dot, um, they are little n dimensional. So there's only n generalized coordinates and n uh, derivatives of those coordinates. And then this vector function n it's going to be um, of dimension m. So we'll have m non-holonomic constraints that could be possible in a, in a general system. All right. <clears throat> so let's take a look at another example. So this is one of the simplest examples of a non-holonomic constraint, and it's called uh, or, or named after Chaplikin. So it's called the Chaplikin sleigh. All right. So this is uh, sort of the simplest model of a few of a few things, right? You could think of it as a model of uh, an ice skate. Right? We know that uh, when an ice skate is sliding across the ice. Um, the motion, uh, you can't easily slide the ice skate lateral and the uh, perpendicular to the blade. Um, a ski on snow or the runner or ski of the sleigh on snow. So in general, these uh, skates or skis can only move in the direction they're pointed. They can't move uh, lateral or perpendicular to the blade. Okay, so let's sketch out a little um, diagram. So I'm going to have some unit vectors here associated with a reference frame in. And um, I'll introduce a, a point O that is fixed in N. And then we'll draw a little skate. So I will just use a, a thin rectangle to represent that skate. And it's going to set it at an angle here in some arbitrary position relative to O. Um, now I'm going to 
put a point that's fixed in the sleigh. Uh, we'll call that we'll call that P. Just in the center of the sleigh there. And this point P is located relative to O by a couple of dimensions. So we'll have an X coordinate. This will be one of our generalized coordinates. It gives us that dimension. And we'll have a Y coordinate. Oops, not too straight. So we've got X and Y that locate P in uh, relative to O in the end frame. And then I'm also going to introduce a reference frame here, A, that has its a x unit vector pointed in this direction. And it then would have this a y pointed like so. And then the last detail is that uh, this reference frame is going to be oriented by a coordinate Uh, theta relative to the uh, in x direction. So I'll have theta here as a third coordinate. All right. So we have, um, in that case, three generalized coordinates that specify the configuration of this um, sleigh. Uh, which we're modeling as a single like ski or runner on the ground. So three generalized coordinates. X, Y, and theta. All right. Uh, label this as A. And I think I have everything labeled in the diagram. So we can write out uh, some position and velocity expressions now. So let's take the vector from O to P. We know that is X in X plus Y in Y. And then the velocity of P in N will simply be X dot in X plus Y dot in Y. All right, and then we have the angular velocity of A and N. It's a simple rotation, so we'll have theta dot in the NZ or similarly in the AZ direction. All right, so those are important velocities that are present. Now, um, we've said that the runner can only travel in the direction that is pointed. So it can only have a velocity component in the AX direction at any given time. So we're gonna then impose a new constraint that has to do with the velocity component in the AY direction, all right? Um, how can we impose that? Well, we I can just write down pretty much what I said. The velocity at point P and N dotted with this AY direction must be equal to zero. No velocity in the AY direction. All right. So this must always be zero. And we see that we're making this constraint now with a velocity term. So it clues us in to we're probably building a motion constraint. Um, I can write the in X and the ny vectors in terms of ax and ay. So these would be cosine theta, ax plus, oops, minus sine theta, ay. And ny would equal sine theta, ax plus cosine theta, ay. All right, if we do that, I can rewrite my velocity of P in terms of the A-frame, and that'll help us take our dot product uh, quite easily. So this K 
can then be, do I have enough space? I think so. Written as, I'll put a big square bracket, I'll have a x dot cosine theta plus y dot sine theta will be my a x term, right? If I substitute nx and ny into here, and then regroup with just the ax and the ay terms, and then I also have the ay term minus x dot sine theta plus y dot cosine theta. And that would be in the ay direction. So if I dot this with the ay, then the component that I am interested in is that. So now we have our constraint equation. x dot sine of theta plus y dot cosine of theta must be equal to zero at all times. This is our single motion constraint equation here. So we have one, uh, call it that, we have one m equals one non holonomic constraint. And this has to do with, we see that we have time derivatives of our generalized coordinates as well as our generalized coordinates in place there. Um, this equation, you can write it a little more simply. Um, if you do a little bit of trigonometry, you can write x dot tan theta minus y dot theta equals zero. And I'll work with that form for this next part. Okay, so let me save. That's the Chaplin sleigh. Um, we see that we have this motion constraint that prevents will prevent any motion in the y direction. It can still slide and it can still rotate, right? Because this is only in the a y direction. So as it moves, you can still make a curving path, but you can't simply move p directly in the a y direction, right? Okay, so imagine that we have a configuration constraint, not a motion constraint, a configuration constraint. Um, some f of h equals zero, a single configuration constraint that looks like this. I'll just say cosine q1 minus l sine q2 must equal to zero. And that is some single configuration constraint uh, of the two variables q1 and q2, the two configuration variables. Okay, So if it's a configuration constraint, only one of these can be independent. Uh, but if I have this, I can differentiate it with respect to time. And if I do so, then I'll get a, um, a negative sine q1 by the chain rule times a q1 dot, and then a minus L cosine q2 also times a q2 dot equals zero. All right, so here we have our function, which is a function of the time derivatives of our coordinates and the coordinates themselves. So it looks like a non-holonomic constraint. All right, so that's interesting, but we know that we started with a configuration constraint, a holonomic constraint, 
just simply differentiated, and, and then we get this thing that looks like a non-holonomic constraint. Um, and so this right, is a function of q1 dot, q2 dot, q1, and q2. So that fits, fits the bill, uh, but we already know, right, because we just did the differentiation operation, that we can go in reverse. We know that the integral of this f of h um, with respect to time, uh, oops, this is supposed to be n, f of n, um, it equals our original f of h, right? So we know this relationship holds, and so um, this second equation that we have here is really just a non-holonomic constraint in disguise. So um, f of n is a um, holonomic constraint. I said that wrong there. A holonomic constraint in disguise. So if you can convert any um, this guys, if you can convert any function of the q dots and the q's back to a function of only the q's, then you actually just have a holonomic constraint. Okay, and uh, you don't want to consider it as a not a holonomic constraint, and we'll talk about. How, why that matters when we form equations of motion. But the question this raises is, well, if I have some arbitrary function that I've derived, how do I know whether it's a configuration constraint or it's really a non-holonomic constraint? The um, integral is not always, sometimes you could potentially take this integral and actually figure it out, but in general you have these nonlinear equations and um, integrating them in, with respect to time is impossible to do analytically. So you can't just take this integral and see if you get the equation you want. But we can uh, apply a, um, a, a nice theorem to let us check that. Alright, so to see if any given uh, non-holonomic constraint is, in, is integrable, um, you can do this check. All right. If we have some non-holonomic constraint that is the time derivative of a holonomic constraint, then we should be able to write the equation here in this form. We have to be able to. The f, the h dt, and I'm only going to do this. Oh no, I have it written out generally. The partial of f h with respect to the partial of these coordinates that are present um, times dq1 dt right? plus and we'll walk through all coordinates that are present there and I'll use capital N in this case because it may be a it may be a holonomic constraint, right? And uh, that would be dQ capital N dt. And then there's also, there's, if it's explicit in time, that piece there. So we can write this function, um, and this is the chain rule, as you can see, for uh, all these Qs that are implicitly functions of time, we can, we can write it in this form. Okay, for the Chaplin Slay, I'm sure I'm butchering Mr. Chaplin's name. We only have three coordinates, 
x, y, theta. So our, to check our fn that we derived, we know that if it is a derivative of some, a time derivative of some holonomic constraint, then it would take this form, the partial of that holonomic constraint with respect to x times x dot, and I'll just use the dot notation, plus the partial of f with respect to y times y dot, plus the partial of f h with respect to theta times theta dot. Okay, so that applying that, we have this uh, equation, and, uh, and remember our um, fn was x dot tangent theta minus y dot equals zero. So we can see by inspection that uh, the coefficients of our x dot is, th is this term, right? So that's going to be tan theta. Coefficient of y dot will be negative one. And then there is no theta dot, so we don't have that term there. So we can identify now that the partial with respect to x equals tan theta. The partial of with respect to y equals negative one. And the partial with respect to theta equals zero. All right, so we've identified those terms in our non-holonomic constraint. Now, uh, the theorem that becomes useful here is named after three uh, mathematicians. So it's either called the Schwartz, the Clairaut, Clairaut, uh, let me spell that right, I think it's that, or Young's theorem. Um, tells us that f and f of n, right, this non holonomic constraint, um, is not integrable if the mixed partials do not commute. So what that means is that uh, the second partial of f of h with respect to a different variable, if it does not equal the second derivative of f of h partial of uh, y and then partial of x, then we'll, hit, we'll get a non-integrable form. Okay, so in general, the mixed partials commute for continuous functions. And uh, we have to think about all three uh, pairs here. So we'll have also these equations, theta and y. Y theta partial of x and theta. So if we get any of these not to be equal, then we know the function is not integrable. So we can check these because we've figured out what these partials are. We just need to take their uh, second derivative with respect to the other variables, and we can check those. Um, so we'll start with um, this first one. So the partial squared f of h, uh, x and y. So if we start with the y term, which was negative 1, and then we take the partial with respect to uh, x of negative 1, we get 0. And then and I guess I can just write, right, I'll just do this equal to zero. The partial of uh, tangent theta with respect to y is also is equal. Okay, so this one is good. We can 
integrate if that one if uh, the other two are fine if we check uh, the y term right that's negative one with respect to theta we also get zero if we check the theta term which is zero and take it with respect to y we get a zero good and then if we check the um, theta term which is zero with respect to x we also get a zero but the x term is tangent of theta well the partial of tangent of theta with respect to theta gives us a secant squared theta right so not integrable so all of these would have to be equal for it to be integrable so it's not integrable that means uh, it's a good thing we, we have an essential non holonomic constraint so x dot tan theta minus y dot equals zero is an essential non-holonomic constraint. Okay, we can't integrate it to get back some simple holonomic constraint. Okay, that's the first video here. You now uh, have an idea of what a motion constraint is. You know how to check to make sure that that is in fact really a non-holonomic motion constraint. And we talked about these two uh, basic examples. All right.